k times n o squared. But then a proposed mechanism looks like this. We think that this reaction occurs in two steps, where two NO2s run into one another and uh, make some products. And then one of the products, which is an intermediate, gets used up in the next step. Anybody feel like clicking? I got this. Um, wait, do some more. Wait, wait, can we go back to the room? so proud. Oh, oh, would you go back when you get there? Go to the previous slide. Wait, so should we write this down or? That's not no, I don't think so. Um, why, um, why would the NO2 not count as a uh, intermediate? An intermediate is defined as any substance that's produced in one step and then gets used up in another step. <coughs> Wait, so, so the NO2 was a reactant. Yeah. The, whoever was doing the experiment had to have NO2 and put it into the reaction container. Okay. But that's not an intermediate. Oh, okay. It's a reactant. It's something that is chemically changing in the reaction. That's, uh, that's real. Is that how like carbonic acid quickly like doesn't stay as carbonic acid? Yes. When it's made, it's kind of an intermediate because then it breaks down into CO2 and water. Yep. So only the NO3 would be kind of Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Go ahead. Now I recopied this, and again I don't think I want you to record or write this down because we don't have enough time. You saw that term in the reading, the molecularity. Molecularity is how many particles are running into one another in an elementary step. In step one, the molecularity is two. You have two molecules that have to run into one another to produce these new things, the new product. And then in step two, the molecularity is two, because two molecules have to run into one another. If I tell you that the first step is the slow step in this reaction, uh, and that's going to be the rate determining step, then the rate law of the reaction would just be the rate law of the slow step. And so the rate would be K times NO2 squared. So that's what we're NO2 times NO2. So this is what we find as the experimentally determined rate law, and that's also uh, makes that a valid mechanism. All right, now go ahead, Rithi, and, and flip that one over. And this slide we are going to want to uh, copy down. These two criteria are necessary for knowing whether a mechanism is valid or not. Here. Um, wait, so this is the slow step, right? The 2 and the 2? Yes, that's the slow step, so that determines the rate. Right. Yeah. Now, for the sake, while you write that down, for the sake of folks that weren't here, uh, Rashid, come on back here. And we're going to do the demonstration again. I showed this earlier, forgot to have it recorded. Don't look at me, though, write that down. So, the idea here is if we have 500 ml of water and we pour it as fast as possible without spilling into another beaker, uh, that takes just a few seconds. But if you have it go through several steps, it takes a little bit longer because it has to, uh, to make its way through these funnels. Now, if we have one of our funnels looking like this, and again, the whole reaction is just pouring the 500 ml of water into the other beaker. But if the steps go like that, without spilling. You see that it takes much longer. So you get the idea. This thing would be the rate determining step. It doesn't matter how fast the water is going through these two funnels. This one is definitely much slower than these two. So really, the rate of getting this water into that beaker is determined by this step. So uh, that was just an analogy of what a rate determining step is. We do have notes. Do you, you have notes? You want to say that? Yeah. Yeah. Could I? We good with that? So when you have to analyze a mechanism, you're looking for these two things to be true. And if they are, that means that the mechanism is a valid mechanism. As it said in the book, a mechanism can't be proven. You can't say, oh yeah, definitely this is the mechanism 
uh, but it can either be valid or invalid, and that's what we're going for with this kind of thing. Um, chemists don't know necessarily how what steps uh, a reaction goes through, but they can just propose the way that uh, they think it, it, uh, it goes through. So you can't really prove. When you get intermediates, I don't have any on this slide, but uh, like that NO3 in the previous slide, how do you know it was there? Because it gets made and then it gets used up right away. Especially it was in a fast reaction. So it's, uh, um, it's, it's not a very clear science as to how to know what the mechanism is. All right, let's see, go ahead. Tile. Now, uh, go ahead back. Take out the handout that we were working on yesterday. It had the six different problems on it. Yesterday we skipped number three, so let's go to that one now. Okay. Now does the rate law look familiar for this one? Or does the equation look familiar? Yeah. Yeah, I think I've seen that one before. It's right there. It was like, like we did it a while ago. Yeah. yeah. So the rate ex uh, experimentally is given to you there. Rate equals K times H2 times NO squared. Which of the following mechanisms can be ruled out on the basis of the observed rate expression? So what we're looking for is, you've got mechanisms 1, 2, and 3. Are any of those not valid? That's what the question is asking. Or maybe all of them are valid. Maybe then none of them are valid. So we have to check them out. So, I ask Ricky to leave this uh, slide up here because remember, these two criteria are necessary for our mechanism to be valid. And let's take a look. The first mechanism. First of all, do those three steps add up to the overall chemical equation? Yeah. yeah. I guess you could say yes. Yes. I think they do. Yeah. They do. But you have a couple of intermediates there. You have an N as an intermediate and an O as an intermediate. But you cancel those out, and they add up to the given balance equation. Are you with me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, that's not uh, So mechanism one, at least uh, we can't say that it's valid yet because it's got one of the criteria passed. The second one is, uh, does its mechanism uh, agree with... No. I'm sorry, not as bad. Does its rate law agree with the experimentally observed no. rate law? Now, the slow step, uh, the slow step would have its uh, rate law look like this. So the rate of mechanism one would be the rate law constant times the uh, the slow steps molecularity, which is there's an H2 molecule running into a an O molecule. That was the slow step. Does that agree with what they found experimentally for the rate law? No. 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 They found NO should be squared. This is a no-go. It's no good. Yeah. Um, for the uh, rate of the reaction, why is the... Um... Oh, wait, never mind. Just... Remember see. that the rate law is found experimentally. That's the only way you can find it uh, is, is by doing this uh, reaction in several trials and varying the concentrations, like we talked about yesterday. But remember that when you propose a mechanism, it's only the slow step that we look at the rate law of. And that should reflect the entire uh, reaction because that's the rate determining step. All right, so anyway, we're shooting down mechanism one because even though the steps add up to the overall equation, the rate law of the first mechanism is not consistent with what we saw experimentally. The NO should be squared. Mechanism two. Do those two steps add up to the overall equation? Yes. Yeah. yeah, they do. I think they are going to every time, to be honest, every example we look at. So then let's jump to the uh, slow step. Now, does the slow step reflect the same rate law as the uh, experimentally yes. observed one? Yes. yes, it does. Yeah. The rate of mechanism two, based on the slow step, is going to be equal to some rate constant times H2. Now you see that there's two NOs. And then we get to mechanism. So anyway, rate uh, the mechanism two is valid. So so far we can throw out mechanism one, but we keep mechanism two as a valid. 
Okay, now what about three? Is something uh, that's a bummer in <coughs> mechanism three? It's an equilibrium. There's an equilibrium in there. Does that make a difference? <coughs> yeah. What? Here's why. Because when we look at the slow step, well, first of all, do the three steps add up to the overall equation? You yeah. have to look at that first. Yes, they do. Okay. So the second thing is, is the slow step of the third mechanism consistent with what we found experimental, no. where there's one, uh, the H2 is first order, NO is second order. No. Don't be so quick. Yes. Because of that equilibrium <laughs> that's in there. Okay, we have to talk a little bit about equilibrium because you're going to oh, see it showing up quite a bit. Yes. yes. Because it's fast yes. equilibrium, right? Because the fact that it's yeah, fast equilibrium. Yeah, when it says fast principle. equilibrium, it's kind of dumb. I don't like that. I, we know that it's equilibrium because of the two arrows. All they have to do is say fast. It gets to equilibrium quickly. Okay? Because when you say fast equilibrium, does that mean it's going forward and backward very quickly? Well, no, it means nothing is happening. Right? Um, so for the equilibrium reactions, it should just say fast. And sometimes it will, and sometimes it'll say the word equilibrium, which is kind of silly. But anyway, the slow step of mechanism three looks like this. Rate of step two. Well, I think it actually was, uh, uh, I'm going to say this. Rate equals the equilibrium constant. That's, remember, a lowercase k times N2O2 times H2. Now, in your first glance, you say, no, this is not a valid rate law or not a valid mechanism because the rate of the slow step is not the same as the experimentally determined rate law. However, what is N2O2 in this mechanism? Well, it's an intermediate. That I'm looking for you to say it's an intermediate. Yes? You can't define a rate of a reaction based on the concentration of an intermediate. It's made in one step and then it gets used up in another step. So that doesn't, uh, doesn't really have a concentration that we can work with. So if you have a rate that's determined by an intermediate, you have to do something about it. You've got to get rid of the intermediate. Okay? Yeah. So how are we going to get rid of it? How was the M2O2 made? It was made in an equilibrium reaction, was it? Yes. Yes. Right. All right, so anyway, if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down for yourself. Never define a rate based on an intermediate. So we don't like this, but we can fix it, and then we can decide if it's good or not. Is it going to turn out to be good? Yeah. It does, yeah. So let's take a look. Because the N2O2 is an intermediate, we have to get rid of it. But it was made in an equilibrium reaction in a step before that. So if we look at the equilibrium constant, capital K, of reaction one. So I'm going to call that reaction or step one in that mechanism. You know how the equilibrium constant is the concentration of products over the reactants? That's what we're going to do for that. The products of that first step are N2O2, and the reactants were NO, but there's two of them, so it gets squared. Now, are you able to tell the difference between my lowercase case and my capital case? You should be able to. Yeah, I try to make them look different. The lowercase k, you know, goes up to the middle. Capital K all the way up to the top. So, this thing right here, we don't like it. The H2 is fine, but that term we don't like. But can that be replaced? Yes. Yes, it can, using this. And that's what we have to do. We have to replace this thing with N2O2 can also be called the equilibrium constant of step one times the NO squared. Are you with me? Just doing a little algebra and just making a substitution in there. So this thing is K1 <coughs> times NO squared. And so if I replace that with that, then I can rewrite this rate law of the slow step. K, lowercase, times 
k of step one, 